It is a great honor and pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Jay Vacanti, the 51st president of the American Pediatric Surgical Association. Jay is going to deliver his one year COVID pandemic delayed presidential address. To begin, Jay is a second generation Sicilian American from a family of eight children. His maternal and paternal grandfathers immigrated from Sicily to Omaha, Nebraska because of job opportunities in America created by the Union Pacific Railroad. Here are Jay's parents, Joanna and Charles, on their wedding day, flanked by Jay's grandparents. Jay's mother dropped out of college six hours short of a pre-medical degree in order to marry. His father became a professor of dentistry, an oral surgeon, and a pioneer in endodontics at Creighton University in Omaha. This shows five generations of vacantes. Here's Jay, and he's in medical school with the fifth generation up front. The Vacantes were a very large and influential Sicilian American family in Omaha. Jay told me we were like the family in The Godfather, but without the violence or the crime. In kindergarten, Jay declared that he was going to be a surgeon. The Vacanti children had an idyllic childhood and Jay was the ringleader, bike riding, the thrill of Christmas morning, playing cowboys. This shows an article from the New York Times in 2003 entitled, Scientists at Work, Joseph, Jay, Charles, Chuck, Martin, uh, Marty, Francis, uh, Frank, from old cars to cartilage, brothers like to tinker. It wasn't always obvious that the Vacanti boys were destined to become doctor scientists, much less that they would become, that they would come to dominate the esoteric field of tissue engineering. There was, after all, that episode with the jalopy and all of its parts when they were children. Led by Jay, they methodically took apart the car in their backyard. Are you sure you can get that back together? Their mother, Joanna Vicanti, recalls asking. Sure, mom, they answered. We've labeled everything. Car parts piled up in the yard, but it never ran again, Joanna Vicanti said. That was the first experiment. Winston Churchill said, success is going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. The Vicanti brothers learned this important lesson early in life. Success came later. Jay attended, Cre Jay attended Creighton Preparatory School and his, Jesu and his Jesuit education has had a big impact on his life. Coming from a family of eight children, money was always tight. When it came time for college, Jay, the oldest, longed to go to Harvard. His father pulled him aside one day and told him he could work his way through the Ivy League school or go to Creighton University where his dad was on faculty for free. Jay graduated summa cum laude and number one in his class at Creighton. He received his medical degree with high honors from the University of Nebraska. But despite these outstanding accomplishments, Jay did not have great confidence in the likelihood of being accepted into a strong surgical program. So, he interviewed at 25 surgical training programs across the United States. He was able to afford such expensive travel by packing up his young family in a Volkswagen van camper and then camping close to the medical centers for the interviews. He was accepted into his first choice surgical program, the Massachusetts General Hospital, still number one. While at the MGH, he committed to becoming a pediatric surgeon. He then worked in Dr. Judah Folkman's lab at Boston Children's Hospital during his surgical training and then pediatric surgical training at Boston Children's. Dr. Hardy Hendren was an enormous influence on Jay, first at the MGH, and then Jay became Dr. Hendren's first chief resident at Boston Children's when Dr. Hendren was appointed chief of surgery there in 1981. Dr. Judah Folkman was a lifelong mentor and inspiration leading Jay from apprenticeship to mastery in medical research. Dr. Folkman taught Jay, and he taught all of us, that as long as there is an unconquered disease, an injury that cannot be repaired, or a method of prevention that remains beyond reach, we have an obligation to conduct research. Research represents hope, and for many patients and families, hope is the best thing we have to offer. We pursue our investigations so that one day we can offer more than hope, 
we can offer health. Jay joined the surgical faculty at Boston Children's in 1983 and worked there for two decades and then moved across town to the Mass General Hospital for Children as the surgeon in chief. He left an impressive trail of innovative clinical work and outstanding basic science research. He instituted New England's first successful pediatric ECMO program. He advocated for delayed repair of congenital, of congenital diaphragmatic hernia at a time when that was, was heresy. He started the nation's first liver transplant program specifically for children. He was a pioneer in the field of tissue engineering, a mission that stems from his long held interest, solving the problem of organ shortages. He and Bob Langer, a chemical engineer at MIT, worked on an approach to growing tissue involving a scaffold made of biodegradable polymer, seeding it with living cells and bathing it in growth factors. In the summer of 1986, Jay took his family to Cape Cod for vacation and while observing seaweed at the beach, he had an epiphany. He realized how nature, the original tissue engineer, used scaling in fractal distribution networks to allow access to oxygen and nutrients for the three-dimensional growth of cells on polymers. The tissue engineering research of Vicanti and Langer gained tremendous momentum. Here's the review article in Science in 1993. Of course, Jay enlisted the help of his brothers, Marty, Frank, and Chuck in this effort. At that time, all were physicians at Harvard. Jay has led the field of tissue engineering, founding co-president of the Tissue Engineering Society and the founding senior editor of the journal Tissue Engineering. Langer and Vicanti edited Principles of Tissue Engineering, now in its fifth edition, with some added editors to help tackle the 1,678 pages. Jay has authored more than 335 articles, 70 book chapters, and 57 reviews. He has 83 patents or patents pending in the US, Canada, Europe, and Japan. He has been involved in more than 20 startups, and his trainee diaspora are disseminated all over the world. And then there was the Vacanti mouse that had what looked like tissue engineered human ear grown on its back, here described in Wikipedia. This photo went viral on the, on the internet and fired up the popular imagination. A Newsweek exclusive was entitled, Whatever Happened to the Mouse with the Ear on Its Back? Apparently, many people had children asking those questions to which Jay responded, so we removed the ear, the mouse was not harmed by our work, and the mouse lived a happy, normal life. Jay's list of awards and honors is staggering. Like William E. Ladd, Jay Vacanti is a surgeon, teacher, and pioneer. The John Scott Medal from the city of Philadelphia was created in 1816 in memory of Benjamin Franklin. It is given to the most deserving men and women whose inventions and innovations improved the comfort, welfare, and happiness of humankind in a significant way. The list of recipients is incredible. Family is Jay's greatest accomplishment. Jay's wife, Susan Tracy, is the love of his life, his life partner who contributes to and shares in everything. I am personally very grateful to Susan. She was the nurse who ran the surgical clinic when I was pediatric surgical fellow at Boston Children's. I would ask Susan when stumped by a patient's problem, what do I do with this, Susan? She would calmly and confidently suggest a course of action and she was always right. Thank you, Susan. These family photos say it all. Here's the Vicanti godfather at the head of the Thanksgiving table. What are Jay's hobbies outside of surgery and science? Jay enjoys teaching the grandchildren, reading, fishing, bike riding, teaching typing on an actual typewriter and chess. A close look at the chess board shows that Jay is getting smoked. He's an avid photographer in all different conditions and venues. He's an, an enthusiastic amateur astronomer with an impressive looking telescope. Jay loves cars and motorized vehicles of various types. Here is Jay reliving the joy of that surgical residency interview odyssey in the original Volkswagen van camper 
46 years later. For Jay, Susan, and their family, Nantucket is the place to relax, rejuvenate, and renew. Jay, Susan, my wife Sandy, and I share a wonderful 43-year friendship that is rekindled every summer on Nantucket with lots of stories and lots of laughs. Life is good. Dr. Jay Vicanti, very rare triple threat, skilled pediatric surgeon, innovator par excellence, leader, teacher, colleague, husband, father, brother, grandfather, and friend. Jay, we all look forward to hearing your presidential address entitled, Our Better Angels and the Invention of Hope. Thank you, Dr. Edzik, for your generous and kind introduction. Your words and feelings mean a lot to me, and I value so much our friendship of 40 years. Dr. Waldhausen, thank you so much for allowing me to give my 2020 ABSA presidential address a year late. We have both hoped that this year's meeting would be an in-person event, as it has always been, but the pandemic has again delayed that hope. I would also like to thank the ABSA membership and the Board of Governors for the extreme honor of having served as your president. It has been an enormous privilege for me and I shall always be grateful. Before I begin my talk, I would like to briefly thank all who have supported my professional development and goals, from my teachers, colleagues, and friends to my family. 51 years into my adventure in surgery, there is no one I am more grateful to than this person, Susan, who is so a part of my life that I cannot distinguish our separateness. Thank you forever. We all have the privilege of belonging to a profession that is a supremely human undertaking, the caring for sick children and their families. Bare bones, stripped of devices, diagnostics, pills, and algorithms, it is the human touch of empathy, compassion, and trust that engages us with our patients. My brief talk today is about separating that important fact from the cacophony that envelops us in today's world. We are bombarded with scenes and stories of chaos and cruelty in our society and in the world at large. We see the worst and the best of human behavior. So which is it? Which is it that we can predict determines the future for us, for our patients, for our families, indeed, for all of humanity? By definition, our work is to do good. So are we Pollyannas in a cruel and destructive world leading to a catastrophic end? Or will our future course be charted by the better angels of our nature? This is the question I will address for us as pediatric surgeons and for us going forward. I will use the knowledge of our physical world and our accumulated knowledge of human evolution to address this fundamental question. In the entirety of the history of our physical universe and our planet, humans may not be special but we certainly are unique. To date, we know that life exists only here on Earth. We also know currently that some 4,300 exoplanets circling other stars exist. And the data suggests that just over 50 of these are in the Goldilocks zone, meaning that they exist in a physical circumstance which might generate and support life. Here on Earth, we know that single-cell organisms first arose about three and a half billion years ago, roughly a billion years after Earth's formation. Multicellular organisms evolved about a billion and a half years ago. So now let's fast forward to seven million years ago, and we see the common ancestor for chimpanzees and us, Homo sapiens. This is where our lineage diverged from monkeys and apes. What forces of natural selection over seven million years 
brought us from a clear animal state to the modern state of humanity today. If we can gather information from the fossil record, not only about the physical evolution of man, but also his social evolution and behavior, perhaps we can surmise the roots of our dual nature, good versus evil, truth versus lies, cooperation versus violence and war. The one physical trait that clearly separates us from other species is our brain. Not so much its physical structure, but rather its sheer size. Compared to all other animals, it is said that our brains are seven times too large for our bodies. How did this evolutionary event happen? The fossil record brings two important milestones for man's development together about one and a half to two million years ago. Humans began to control the use of fire and man's brain began to enlarge at an almost astonishing rate. Homo erectus used fire at camp size and began to cook food. The link between brain growth and fire was cooking. Cooking released huge amounts of stored energy from food sources and also made food more easily chewable and digestible. The result was a massive competitive advantage for our ancestors compared to other species. As evolution progressed, so too did brain size. By the time Homo sapiens emerged between 300,000 and 200,000 years ago, brain capacity had far outstripped other species. The increase in mental capacity with the discovery of cooking led to a number of evolutionary developments in early man, which made us uniquely human by the time of the emergence of Homo sapiens. A significant step was advanced to social behavior resulting in complex societies. According to E.O. Wilson, in 400 million years of animal evolution, this has only occurred 20 times, other examples being insects, crustaceans, and a few species of rodents. This eusociality is defined as the creation of a protected nest from which foraging starts and within which young are raised to maturity and both the parents and offspring stay in the nest and cooperate to raise new generations. This produces a division of labor into risk-prone foragers and risk-adverse parents and nurses. So imagine two million years ago, the social intelligence at a campsite anchored our predecessors. This led to storytelling, cooperation, invention, and altruism. The survival advantage that resulted was groups of altruistic individuals won over groups of selfish individuals. But within a single group, selfish individuals overcame altruistic individuals. And thus arose the duality of our human nature. Individual selection promotes selfishness or sin. Group selection promotes altruism or virtue. And so, by 200,000 years ago, humanity had the basic tools to proceed with developing modern civilization, imagination, and cooperation. Our brains allowed us to move back and forth between what is and what could be. Our imagination created abstract thought and symbolism. Ideas became realities that were actionable. Laws were ideas in the abstract. Nation states were ideas producing loyalty, honor, and pride. Symbolic signs have meaning only because those using them have agreed upon the meaning. The United States flag is only a cloth with colored patterns and has no meaning without a group of people assigning and applying meaning. In fact, all language and the written word are just sounds and markings without assigned symbolic meaning. From this ability to use symbols and ponder the future came the ability 
to hope. It reflects the human ability to generate future outcomes by using more than just what is predictable. It requires imagination for a justification take, to take on risky actions that might normally be predicted to fail. Hope is a fundamental part of human existence. So what of the dark side of human duality? Is it dominant in our future? Are we fated by genes and evolution to descend into madness and destruction? We can look to the fossil record and find comfort in the timing of the development of sophisticated mass violence and war. In fact, the evidence shows that it comes late and is associated with the invention of agriculture and the conversion from a nomadic existence to permanent settlements, towns, and cities. It is temporally related to the control of resources in land, food, and property. This occurred very recently, between 10 and 15,000 years ago. The fossil evidence of caretaking and compassion dates to 1.8 million years ago. If we look at the markers of violence from 2 million years ago all the way to 10,000 year ago, years ago, the data from 2,600 individuals in 400 sites shows only 58 instances of evidence of trauma, meaning that 98% of human fossils over a 2 million year period showed no evidence of injury. This is in stark contrast to the last 10,000 years where there is an ever-increasing rate of traumatic injury and instances of mass system systematic trauma and lethal conflict from warring groups. And so, to summarize our sprint through human evolutionary history, we, as compassionate caregivers, can take comfort that our role is more consistent with the core expression of our DNA, and that we can more confidently hope for a better future through our imagination, creativity, invention, and our boundless determination to make a difference in doing good. Our technology has allowed us to take a selfie, a snapshot of us as humans in the context of the physical world. We can look out and see ourselves at a distance. That image is a stark fact for philosophers and for us all. Thank you very much. It had been well understood by the scientists and philosophers of classical antiquity that the earth was a mere point in a vast, encompassing cosmos. But no one had ever seen it as such. Consider again that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on the mote of dust, suspended in a sunbeam. The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot. I dreamed I walked in heaven just the other night. There was so much beauty, so much light. Don't you wish it was true? Don't you wish it was true? An angel took my hand, said you don't have to hurry. Got all the time in the world, don't worry. Don't you wish it was true? Lord, don't.
don't you wish it was true? But if tomorrow everybody was your friend, anyone could take you in, no matter what or where you've been. But if tomorrow everybody had enough, the world wasn't quite so rough. Lord, don't you wish it was true? He said the world gonna change and it's starting today. There'll be no more armies, no more hate. Don't you wish it was true? I don't you wish it was true? And now the little children who live happily, they'll be singing and laughter, sweet harmony. Don't you wish it was true? <laughs> 